if you've got a home in heaven, come on, Bill. Go ahead and let the Lord know it by a standing ovation and round of applause. <laughs> you know, some of our homes on earth aren't that awesome. <laughs> some of us live in the hood. You know, I'm so honored to be able to share God's word with you today. Somebody told me to take out the sword and cut you all up. I don't know what you've done, but I'm happy to oblige. Appreciate our service so far. It's been amazing today, right, brothers and sisters? We learned about Jesus riding in on the donkey saying peace to us. Thank you, Mike and Brittany, for that amazing introduction. Mason and Natalie did an incredible job with the announcements. We had Smokey Joe do an incredible job up here. Today. I appreciate it so much, Victor's communion. How inspiring and touching and moving that was. And then Colton and Mandy's incredible lesson about the Samaritan, the Levite, and the priest. Which one are you? You know, I'm going to talk about something today that is so important to our Christian lives. What is it? And that is that we are the household of God. Okay. It's an honor to be able to speak to you this morning. I'm here representing a king. Come on. I want you to know before I even begin, I'm not here on my own. I've been called to be before you this morning. Come on, bro. And I'm honored to be able to represent the Lord. Come on. And if you get cut today, don't blame me. It's not my fault. I'm just doing what I've been told to do. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. But you are his court. You are his people. You are the members of his household. And it's humbling to be able to stand before you this morning. And trust me, I understand who I'm standing before. The very sons and daughters of God. Our sermon today is two parts. I'm going to preach the word for a little while. And then we're actually going to have a a demonstration of what I'm talking about in the form of a skit a little bit later. And so you're going to get to hear the word, and then you're going to get to see the word in action. Amen. Go ahead and turn in your Holy Scriptures over to Ephesians in chapter 2. We want to begin there. You may be wondering what these this, this half circle of chairs are up here for. Uh, I have requested those because I like to preach the word, but I like to be preached back to as well. Amen. I really don't like speaking to a boring, hey. unspiritual oh. audience. Oh. And so these chairs up here are for any individual that I see out there that's not fired up for God. Holy temple. 
in the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built. Okay. Together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by His Holy Spirit. You know, the church is God's household. Our God does not dwell in a temple anymore. He does not dwell in the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Our God dwells in His New Testament church. The Bible says at one time we were foreigners and strangers. And yet God allowed us to become his people. He allowed us to become the very members of his household. Come on. That's awesome. Come on, John. Some of us didn't grow up in very good households. You know, perhaps the Garcia household wasn't all that good. You know, the Cosby household wasn't all that good. The Roan household was not all that good. In fact, if you didn't go up, grow up in a Christian household, your household probably wasn't that good either. Come on, come on. But God says we're now a part of a new household. The very household of God. Come on. Come on, John. And what a blessing that is. Amen. You know, but this comes with a warning. Look over in Psalms chapter 127. Come on, bro. Oh, I'm coming. <laughs> I appreciate the encouragement to come, though. Psalms 127. Go, bro. The household of God comes with the warning. In chapter 127 of Psalm, if you'd be kind enough to look with me at verse 1, the Bible says, Unless the Lord builds a house, the builder labors in vain. Wow. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guard stands watch in vain. Some of you are here today declaring, I'm king of my castle. Be careful. Because you just might get dethroned. The only king of any castle is King Jesus. He's the king of our castle. He's the builder. He's the head of our household. The Bible says many will spend their lives in vain. In vain. You labor in vain. You spend your days, you spend your years in this world in vain if you don't have a relationship with the true king. Come on, bro. In vain if you're not a part of Jesus' of God's household. Some of you need to make the decision today. Today is my last day. Come on. Talk about me. Living my life. Come on, bro. In vain. Come on. In vain. In vain you rise up early. In vain you stay up late toiling for food. Because he grants sleep for those he loves. You know, we are part of the household of God, but it comes with the warning that unless God builds your house, you don't have a house at all. Watch out trying to be king of your own castle. Look over at Psalms, we find another warning. Oh, I'm cutting y'all up today. <laughs> We're not playing with this. Proverbs chapter 3. Now I love you. My knife is full of love. But I gotta swing it. <laughs> Don't be ducking. <laughs> Go ahead and take your cut. <laughs> So God can heal you up. 
Some of you are living outside the will of God and it needs to stop today. That's why you were invited. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 33. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked. But he blesses the home of the righteous. You know, we need to pay attention to our houses. And that's what today is all about. How many of you are better disciple at church than you are at home? Call me out. Call me out. How many of you would love to be the same disciple you are at church? Sitting there all nice, singing, happy, loving God. Say, I'm about to fill my chair up for this day. <laughs> in scripture. And I don't have time to go through these. Colton took up all my time this morning. <laughs> there are incredible households in the scriptures. There's a household. Write this down. You can study it on out later. In John chapter 11 and 12, there is a single household of Lazarus and his sister Mary and Martha. And so we find single households in the Bible that are amazing. This household was so amazing, Jesus healed Lazarus from the dead. <laughs> in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, okay. there, is, there is this household with, with Timothy and his grandmother Eunice and his mother Lois. And this is an extended household. And we know that, that, that Timothy had such incredible faith and Paul said, you know what, I'm persuaded that the same faith that lived in your grandmother and your mother lives in you because you were a part of that household. So sometimes our households can have incredible impact on the people that live with us. Then of course there is the household of Jesus himself with Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus' brothers and sisters. Look over in Mark chapter 6. Because this is incredible. In Mark chapter 6, very quickly. Amen. This was a traditional household. A husband and wife and, and several and several kids. And Jesus uh, goes up on the Sabbath in the synagogue and, and he preaches and many hear him and they're amazed and they immediately turn to his household. Where did this, where did this man get these things in verse 3? They asked. What is this wisdom that he has been given? What are these remarks and these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense. And so Jesus does these incredible things and they go back and they, they say, well, isn't this the family that he's from? You know, when you do great things, do people think about your spiritual family? What family do people think about when they think about you. Yeah. Jesus' family must have had an incredible impact on him. How would Jesus have done if he was raised in your family? Come on. In your household? Would he have flubbed up the miracles? What a great family. Come on, come on, bro. Then one of the most awesome households in the Bible is a blended household. A Priscilla and Aquila who meet the great apostle Paul in Acts chapter 18. And he was a tent maker like they were, and he went and they worked together, and Paul lived with them. And they became a blended household. And as a part of that household, Paul actually converted Priscilla and Aquila. God's households are to be fruitful households as well. Incredibly fruitful. The Bible doesn't even 
even let us know how many people this household converted. They just preached the word poverty. We do have the instance in Acts chapter 18 where they meet a man named Apollos. Apollos was a great speaker with great ability. He knew the Old Testament scriptures very, very well. He was dynamic, but his message was incomplete. Come on. He only knew of the baptism of John. You know, there are some of us today, your message is incomplete. Come on, bro. You're inspiring. You love God. You're fired up. You go to church, but your message is incomplete. <laughs> you know nothing about what it means to be a disciple. You've never studied the scripture and examined the scripture. You just took your parents' word for it. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You never dug down deep and really studied out what it took to become a Christian. Maybe you saw a televangelist say, oh, just ask Jesus into your heart. Come on. That's not in the Bible, by the way. Come on, bro. You know, this has always been God's vision for the church. It's always been God's vision for our households to be abundantly fruitful. Because the church is God's household. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Colossians 1 verse 18. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 18. Turn over there real quick. The church is God's household. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness. I'm sorry, wrong passage. I'm running ahead. That's a good, that's a good one. That is a good one. Go ahead and write that one down. Study <laughs> that one in your quiet time. We don't have time for it this morning, though. In verse 18 it says, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the, in the end. He is the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. In God's household, God is everything. Yep. Come on. There's no such thing as you being king of your castle. Right. For a lot of us, we've just got to turn ourselves in today. He's the breadwinner. He's the provider. He's the head of the house. And God pr promises to provide all of our needs. You know, for a lot of us, 
sometimes we can look at ourselves and we can look at how amazing God is and how amazing his household is and we ask ourselves, God, why me? Why do, why do you want me? Don't, don't you know how flawed I am? Why do you want me? I'm not perfect. I've done some bad things, God. I'm flawed. And yet God says, you're my possession. Wow. How many of you love a good bargain? Go ahead and raise your hand. I'm talking about the people that love to go to Ross to shop. What about Ross disciples? What about my TJ Maxx disciples? Do I have any Nordstrom Rack disciples? But God knows this, 
and he wants you in his household anyway. Amen. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, God wants me anyway. pursuit of money, power, and fame, and prestige. They climb aboard the rat race, the treadmill, looking for some meaning in their daily existence, only to find that they just can't stop running. And so many people end up running through the end of their lives with no purpose whatsoever. But God intends his knowledge to be spread throughout the earth like the waters of the sea. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says God's plan for this is for his household to reveal this knowledge and to make it known to the world. Amen. But the Bible also teaches in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 that the message is going to be brought to people through jars of clay. And that's what you are. Oh, I, thought you, I know you thought you were more than that. But that's all you are. You, you were putty in God's hands that, that he has formed into a jar of clay. A jar of clay. You're perplexed on earth every side, but not broken. You're a jar of clay. I'm a jar of clay. But inside of us is a treasure. And that treasure is the word of God. You know, I was having a bowl of soup earlier this week. And I, I was really enjoying my soup. And, and you know, I, I didn't let it cool off. And I put the cup on my lip and it, it scored the bottom of my lip. And I dropped it and the, the cup shattered. It was a beautiful clay cup that, that my wife really liked. But I dropped it and it shattered. And so I picked it up and I threw it in the trash. You know, in Japan, they don't do that. In Japan, if a bowl falls and drops and breaks into pieces, they don't just go throw it away. They take that bowl of clay and they fill it seams with gold. And they put that bowl of clay back together with the beautiful gold seams where it had broken and the new bowl is better than the old bowl. God fills our cracks with gold. We're all cracked. We're all flawed. We're all irregular. We're all on the edge of his table. 
but in Christ our cracks are filled with gold. What's that gold? Our faith. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Peter that our faith is even of greater worth than the gold that fills the cracks. You know, our faith is a precious metal. Some of us like wearing jewelry around our neck. What if you could put your faith around your neck? It's gold. You know, those scars on those bowls, those cracks, those seams, is really what define us as Christians. You realize that God loves picking from the bottom of the pile. You notice that in scriptures. Picking from the bottom of the pile allows God to have more glory. You say, why me? Because you're at the bottom of the pile. You're irregular. And God is picking from the bottom of the pile. Gets more glory through your life. <laughs> Jesus had to make Thomas understand this in John 20. He said, I'll never believe unless I see the scars. But Jesus said, you know what, Peter? Uh, you know what, Thomas? I took my cracks to heaven with me. I took my scars to heaven with me. Look at my hands and look at my feet. And Thomas took his hand and stuck them into Jesus' scars. You ever have anybody do that to you? Take their finger and just stick them right into your scars? Come on. <laughs> and Thomas said, you know what? I believe my Lord and my God. The only thing in heaven from earth to this day are the scars of Christ. Mm. So stop being ashamed about your scars and start preaching about your scars and all that God has done. Let me close with a passage over in Psalms 101. Ah. I want to bring up our skit to talk about how amazing our household of God really is. And what we can do to make our household incredible. Psalms 101 is an incredible psalm. And it really is all about Christian households. And I'm just going to give you four thoughts here. And then you take them. You go study it out. Amen? I don't have time to study. I'm getting ready to put the whole church up here. These two. <laughs> psalms 101. Read this carefully. I will sing of your love with justice to you, Lord. I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what the faithful, faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land. That they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. You want to talk about households? Let's talk about Psalms 101. Come on. Number one. Practically, our households need to be a priority. If you go through this Psalms and you circle every place where it says I and my, you'll make 12 circles in the first seven verses. That is an indication that we individually need to take responsibility. We need to take action. We need to focus. I 
on my household and make it the priority that God wants it to be. We need to make it a priority to make sure God's, our house is a household of God. Number two, you've got to act with intention in your household. Verse two says, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. Now, the emphasis of this sentence is not on being blameless and perfect because we can't be that him. But he does say, I will be careful. How careful are you in your house? You know, verse, verse 2 is, life change, is a life-changing scripture. Have you ever literally taken this scripture to heart and taken a stroll through your house? and to remove anything that didn't belong there that wasn't of God. Have you taken the initiative to be careful to make sure your household is a household of God? Imagine walking through your home and literally removing anything that wasn't of God from your house. Number three, open your eyes. Open your eyes. He says that I will not look with approval on anything that is by me. You know, it's interesting with all young parents is, you know, if you go to the house of a young parent, they'll put that little gate up. It's always in front of the kitchen. I mean, I don't know what's so bad about the kitchen. Parents don't want their kids crawling in. But it's always there. It's always between the stairwells. And then parents put these gates all around different parts of their home to protect their kids, right? Some of you said, my parents didn't. That's why I got this big knot on my head. <laughs> well, they should have. But they put these gates around because they don't want your, their kids to go certain places that perhaps could be dangerous to them in the house. And yet, some of our houses have unfiltered sewer lines that bring unfiltered filth into our homes. What kind of gate do you have around your television? What kind of game do you have around your computer? What kind of game do you have around the video games that your, your kids and your roommates play? Come on, John. I don't know what's going on with the video games. You know, when I was yeah. young, video games used to be just a little bouncy ball and you had this little thing on the bottom. <laughs> seven he says no one who practices deceit will dwell in my house what's your standard for your roommates you think it's okay to have a non-christian roommate 
you haven't looked at Psalms 101. Come on, God. The Bible says you make sure you surround yourself with the faithful. You make sure you dwell and you live with faithful people. Oh, you can reach out to them, but don't you live with them. In closing, in med medical school, when you enter into medical school, they tell you right away that half of what you learn will not be true when you graduate. They just don't tell you which half. It's called the half-life of facts philosophy. In physics, one half of everything that is discovered in research today will be disconfirmed within 13 years. In psychology, it's just seven years. In fact, the world in its wisdom is a great example of the whole notion and the whole idea of half-life of facts. So much of what people are telling you to live your lives on won't be relevant later. But thank God for his holy scriptures. Yeah. It says in Isaiah that every word of God will remain true to the very end. Over 3,500 years in existence. Prophets, teachers, and prophets, and, and, and evangelists, apostles, have preached and taught Jesus himself. And not one stroke of God's word has not been true. You know, I'm calling us to join the household of God today because the word of God doesn't change. There is no half a fact philosophy when it comes to God. When you put your life and your heart and you join the household of God, you can be sure that God's word will remain true and that God will be true. Godly households in the church. You know, like we saw in the households in the lesson, our spiritual households are meant to be fruitful households. They can have impact on the lives of young leaders and young men and women in an incredible way. We want to present to you something that will inspire you about what we can be in our households. God bless you.